sorry for the hurt, I'm sorry for the pain I'm sorry that I ever let you think that you could stay I'm sorry I'm the worst for always playing games I'm sorry I involve you in my 2 a.m. mistakes This ain't fair to no one, you know this isn't love I hate that I'm the person that could mess with someone's trust Tell me what you want to waste Hello, everyone. We meet again at our 2021 Zero Project Conference for Latin America and the American, the Spanish-speaking world on employment and ICTs. My name is Carola Rubia, and I'm, a, I'm the executive director of Fundación Descubreme. Yesterday and today, we have had an extensive program with experiences on inclusive employment and cutting edge technologies for people with disabilities. And undoubtedly, all these initiatives will allow us to meet the main objective of Zero Project, which is a world without barriers for people with disabilities. For those who can see me, I'm a woman with a fair complexion. I'm wearing a blue jacket and a blue trousers, and I have a scarf with flowers of different colors. I would like to start by greeting my drive, my hosting partner, Carolina Garcia, who will be joining us again on this day. Good afternoon, Carolina, and thank you very much for being here. Good afternoon, Carola, and once again, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be able to join you in this magnificent initiative. And of course, for those who cannot see me, I'm a woman with a fair complexion. I'm wearing a black blouse with animal print pants, and I am a person with disabilities, so I am on a wheelchair. It is time to start with a very interesting session of keynote speeches, which we call a global look, awareness and legislation. Moving from discourse to action, we will have to present the presentations of two speakers who, who will talk about how to generate impact in decision-making spaces. Our first speaker, Kate Nash. We'll have former senator from U.S., senator from the state of Iowa, um, Thomas Harkin, and then we'll have Kate Nash, founder and CEO of Purple Space. Let's start then with our session. I have the honor to introduce Thomas Harkin, former U.S. senator from the state of Iowa from 1985 to 2005, as a lawyer from the Catholic University of America. And as a senator, he was the author and principal sponsor of the Americas with Disability Act, ADA of 1990, the primary law promoting and protecting the civil rights of the millions of people with disabilities in the United States. And he's also the founder of the Harkin Institute, housed at Drake University in Iowa. We are truly honored to have him here in this conference, and we are grateful that he's able to share his expertise at Zero Projects Conference. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Carola Rubia, and also Carolina Garcia. I want to thank uh, the Fundacion Descumbre in Chile for all that you've done. Uh, welcome my other speakers. I understand Kate Nash is next. And I also want to thank Martin Nessel. And I know Michael Fembeck is also on from the uh, Essel Foundation and their Zero Project. Uh, uh, we are proud to be a partner with them uh, in, uh, in so many uh, efforts to break down barriers uh, on people with disabilities globally, especially in the field of, in the area of uh, employment. Um, 
And again, the Discover Me Foundation in, in Chile. Again, I applaud all of the work and the, that you are doing there. I want to take a moment to also recognize Caroline Casey of the Valuable 500, who I think you'll be hearing from also. As it was said that uh, in, my, in the introduction, it said I was the author and sponsor of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Well, uh, I always kind of correct that. I was not the author. The author, I always say, were the thousands of persons with disabilities who for 20 years uh, marched, demonstrated, got arrested, and pushed for a civil rights bill here in the United States that would ban discrimination against persons with disabilities. So I always say that they're the authors. I just happened to be in the United States Senate at the right time to champion it, to draft the legislation and sponsor it and get it through. And it was one of my proudest moments in my 40 years of uh, serving in the US Congress uh, to get the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act into law in 1990. Uh, people always ask me why I got involved. Well, I got involved because I had an older brother who was deaf and I saw how he was discriminated against uh, in his lifetime just because he couldn't hear. Uh, he couldn't uh, study the courses he wanted to study in school. Uh, he was sent to a separate school uh, for what we call the deaf and dumb. And as my brother once said to me, I may be deaf, but I'm not dumb. And so I, when I first got elected, I began to work on issues dealing with deafness and communication disorders, and then became involved in the broad effort uh, for disability rights on a broader basis. I might also just add that one of my proudest bills that I am the author of, it's called the TV Television Decoder and Circuitry Act of 1990. What that bill did is it mandated that every television set sold in the United States that had a screen size of 13 inches or bigger had to a, have in the set the decoding chip to decode closed captions. And it was, we gave a three year implementation. Well, what happened is because we mandated every television set had to have the chip, well, the manufacturers, both domestic, but also uh, Japanese manufacturers, Korean manufacturers, later Chinese manufacturers, all put the chips in the TV. And so now it's global. <laughs> Every television set, no matter where, has the decoding chip in it. So I'm, I'm also equally proud of that because it has helped so much in terms of communication uh, as we see that's happening right here, right now. I'm watching my closed captions come across the bottom of my screen. So, um, but I wanna get back to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, there are four goals of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Full participation, equal opportunity, independent living, economic self-sufficiency. Uh, when we drafted, when I drafted the bill and we put in the different titles, I made title one employment because I thought it was the most, it was so important that people with disabilities have job opportunities. Um, and so uh, since I've retired from the United States Senate, I have focused my efforts mainly on that issue, and that's employment of persons with disabilities in what we term competitive integrated employment. That means a job just like anybody else. 
working in an inclusive setting, not not as we say in the United States, a sub minimum wage job, not a job that's a dead end, not a job that's just created for someone with a disability so they can be sort of put a, put away someplace separate and apart from the workforce. We've had that in the United States in the past. So the idea was to break down the barriers and include persons with disabilities right alongside everybody else. Well, I can tell you that we have had a hard time with that uh, in the United States. Here we are 30, 31 years after the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we still uh, have uh, drastic unemployment among persons with disabilities here in the United States. Um, in 2020, uh, less than 18% of people with disabilities were employed. Think about that. That's, that's like <laughs> almost 80% of people with disabilities are not in the workforce. Uh, the United Nations estimates that in developing countries, 80 to 90% of people with disabilities are unemployed. In industrialized countries, somewhere between 50 and 70%. Now, these are pre-pandemic numbers and we know it's gotten worse because of the pandemic. So what we are doing at the Harkin Institute, which I established when I left the Senate, and if you have any questions uh, or you want to make any input to the Institute, you can go to Harkin Institute dot org, O-R-G, and, uh, and either get information or input anything you would like. But what we're, while we're, we have a full disability sector of the Institute, what we're mostly focused on is employment. Now, we do other things, but mostly employment. And so what we wanted to do was to bring together uh, key champions and implementers from around the world to find innovative solutions and share back best practices on breaking down these barriers. And of course, one of the key players in, in this effort is the, is the Zero Project uh, of the Essel Foundation out of Vienna. Uh, they have just been so great on, on this, on a lot of different issues, but especially on, on employment. Now, we established at the Institute an annual summit called the Harkin Summit on Employment. Uh, we have met annually since 2016, three times in Washington, DC, once in Paris, and once virtually, of course, last year in 2020. Uh, next year in 2022, the Harkin Summit will take place in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And I just want to say we are also looking uh, for a host country or a host entity so that we can have a summit in 2023 somewhere in Latin America. And, uh, and since I have been a big friend of Chile's for so many years, uh, it would be nice to have it in Chile. But if, you're, if we can talk about that or go with the Institute website and we can discuss that possibility of having it there in 2023. Now, again, um, I just wanted to say that since we started these, we have had more than 700 people from 68 different countries attend our summits. And again, what we do is bring people together, both employers, uh, government officials, special and disability advocates to talk about best practices. What, what have companies who have successfully employed people with disabilities, what did they do? What were their barriers? How did they overcome it? And what has been their, uh, their experience? I can tell you, without exception, every single company, whether US-based, European-based, um, Japan-based, I'm just thinking of ones that attended our summits, um, every single company 
that made an effort uh, to reach out to the disability community and employ persons with dis disabilities actually did better, did better than companies that didn't. We had a big study done here in the United States uh, by Accenture. And it was a five year study of companies of the same size, uh, same general composition and at the end of five years, they looked at those companies that actively pursued and employed persons with disabilities. And their bottom line was better. They made more profits, more money for their shareholders, um, and had more productivity than companies that didn't hire persons with disabilities. So we've, we're getting a lot of good data, and we know that, um, that uh, the persons with disabilities, if given the right support, first, you have to reach out to the disability community, provide a, 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 uh, an acceptable workplace, a, a welcoming workplace where they're welcomed in and treated like everyone else. Once we do that, companies then find their productivity goes up, workers are happy, uh, and quite frankly, uh, as I remember from my own brother, when he finally got a job in competitive integrated employment, he, was, he did so well and he was able to focus on his job because noise didn't bother him, that he got more parts per hour done with fewer mistakes. Well, then this caused the owners of the company and the managers to institute different uh, regimes, processes, so that other workers could become equally as productive. So I just would leave you with this, because of the, pan because of the pandemic, we're gonna have a different workplace in the future. We know that more and more people are gonna be working remotely. Uh, businesses all around the globe, have found out that when, during the pandemic, when their workers were working remotely, a lot of times they, they were more productive and more happy uh, than if they had to come into an office or a, a work site someplace. People with disabilities have been asking for years to ro work remotely. Businesses have turned them down. Here's a new opportunity globally for persons with disabilities to work remotely from home, where they can have a personal attendant service, where they can uh, don't have to seek transportation or supportive services like that. And so this opens up a whole new air area of possibilities for persons with disabilities to enter the workforce. So uh, think about that and think about in your own country, uh, more and more persons with disabilities who have either intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, perhaps a physical or a combination, who could actually do work from home and do it more product, product, productively than if they had to go to work someplace. I just offer this caution. We have worked for years to integrate the workforces, not to separate out persons with disabilities. So are we now going to have separate workplaces for persons with disabilities to work from home and not be included in, uh, uh, in, a, in a workplace setting? Well, my response to that is this, it should be both. If a company is um, providing both remote work and on-site work, Persons with disabilities had to be offered either one. Let the person with the disability decide. Do they want to work remotely or would they rather be on site? To me, that breaks down that, that, that barrier. Uh, let me close this by, again by applauding Chile for passing your own legislation to advance employment for people with disabilities. You did that in 2018. Uh, the Discover Me Foundation's work to have it passed. Uh, and again, uh, 
the legislation alone is not enough. Uh, regulations have to be written. You have to get, you have to reach persons with disabilities so they know what their rights are. Uh, judges need to be informed of what was intended by the legislation. And um, so it's not just legislation, there has to be follow-up uh, to make sure that the legislation uh, actually works. And I would say the most important thing is to educate the populace. I'll close on this. Uh, a lot of times people ask me, what was the biggest stumbling block, the biggest problem in passing the Americans with Disabilities Act? And my answer is the attitudes of people, the attitudes that are built into society from generations and generations, that a person with a disability is something's wrong with them and they need to be fixed <laughs> and they need to be isolated. That was our biggest problem. And I know that's true all globally. So again, we need more and more education of not only persons with disabilities, but their families, their families and the business community to break down these attitudes. So again, my thanks to Chile and the foundation for all you've done. Uh, and I am proud of what you've done. I look forward to being back in Chile, uh, hopefully by in 2023, uh, hopefully with our, uh, with our summit on employment. With that, I will close and open it for questions. Muchas gracias, senador Hawking. Eh, para nosotros es un honor contar con su participación el día de hoy. Nos gustaría... Thank you very much, Senator Hawking. It is an honor for us to have you, your participation today. We would like to begin this round of questions by emphasizing the relevance on the existence of legislation, regulations, and public policies that promote full inclusion for people with disabilities. And on that line, how do you think we can um, encourage legislators and, authori and authorities to take a step beyond labor inclusion policies? And how do you suggest that decision makers can continue um, full inclusion? Well, as I said, you know, legislation is important and legislators need to be educated about the importance of it. Uh, I can tell you that even 31 years after the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, we've had problems in interpretation. Uh, so judges need to be informed uh, about what, what is meant and regulations need to be drafted. But I think the most important thing is for the disability community, persons with disabilities, to be educated about their rights under this legislation and, and what they can do. And hopefully to set up organizations, uh, some non-governmental, maybe some governmental, uh, to make sure that the legislation is implemented correctly. Um, uh, we had a problem in the United States with the judges misinterpreting it, and it took us 18 years to get the judges straightened out on this. Uh, we passed the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, and in 2008, 18 years later, we had to pass more legislation so that the courts and the judges could get it correct. Uh, so I know there can be stumbling blocks. Uh, but the, the most important thing is, uh, is to educate persons with disabilities so they know their rights. And then organizations can be set up to help implement the legislation uh, on a broader basis. I, well, let me just add one other thing. It's so important to have persons with the lived experience of having a disability to be part of these organizations uh, and others that are talking about implementing uh, the legislation. Uh, it, it's, it, we had a saying here in the States, I'm sure you have it in Chile too, and that is nothing about us 
without us. And, and, and that is so important. Muchas gracias, Senador. Thank you very much, Senator. And I accept your, your proposition for 2023 to support you in your event in Chile. Well, let's work on that. Uh, let's work with the harkaninstitute.org and, and, uh, and our disability director, uh, Daniel Van Sant. Uh, well, just go to the website. We can work it out, but it would be a real privilege and an honor uh, to have uh, a meeting like this in Chile. Um, I have, as I said, I have a long history of my involvement in Chile. Uh, and I don't need to go into that now, but uh, uh, suffice to say, I've been very involved with Chilean governmental matters going clear back to the Pinochet years. Muchas gracias, Senador. Thank you so much, Senator. And to end this round of questions, according to um, 2019 OECD data, we have seen that the public sector typically employs about 18% of the workforce in countries. So their efforts to promote inclusion can have a very high potential impact on their employees and can help set a standard for empl employers. What, what good examples have you seen on inclusion in the public sector and what recommendations would you give to the public sector in Latin America and the Hispanic world to become this role model? Well, uh, I know of so many examples of businesses in America. I would use one. Um, Walgreens Drugstore, it's an international company, big company now. Some years ago, uh, they decided to hire persons with disabilities uh, in their distribution warehouses. And they found that their productivity went up, they had fewer mistakes. I have, I have personally visited these uh, distribution warehouse sites. And uh, I think in in one site, I think it's over 50%. I think it's like almost 80% of their workforce are persons with disabilities. They're paid the same, they have the same benefits, same vacation, same retirement as anyone else. And the CEO of Walgreens told me that that was their most productive work site in America. They got fewer mistakes. People always showed up for work on time. They had fewer turnovers, so they didn't have a big expense on training. Uh, and the workers were just loyal and, and uh, paid attention to their job, always showed up. So we have those kind of examples. And, and, and the OECD, I know uh, they do have to, uh, 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 again, put more focus on those companies that have had this experience and show them as an example. And we need the companies together. And that's what we've tried to do with our summit meetings, get the companies that have been successful to begin to reach out to others. Uh, at our last one, we had a small company. Well, it was a company that employs about a thousand people, not real small. And uh, they had not had any uh, experience of employing persons with disabilities. They attended our summit a couple of years ago and then embarked on a process of hiring persons with disabilities. And they have found, again, like so many before them, that their whole workforce actually became better because they had persons with disabilities working there. Uh, their productivity, everything went up, but the workforce itself became more congenial, uh, more fully integrated, uh, and found that 
that workers who were not disabled uh, felt a sense of pride in being able to teach and to men mentor uh, persons with disabilities who are just coming onto the work site and getting their initial training and knowing what to do. Uh, and the workers who had been there before, as I said, took a great sense of pride in this and, um, and, and found that the whole workforce became much more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, more integrated, more congenial, more supportive of one another uh, in their jobs. I think, I think that I would just say also that the one thing that I liked about the OECD uh, data was that um, they're talking about not only uh, inclusion, but accessibility. And that's so important. You can talk about inclusion, but it has to be accessible. It has to be accessible. And we have found in the past, again, in the United States, and I, 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 I know the Essel Foundation has found this also in other countries, that, that the accessibility features are not that expensive. Mm. It, it, it doesn't break the bank. Uh, it doesn't uh, cost a lot of money uh, to make the workplace accessible. And again, we have found that when the workplace is made accessible for persons with disabilities, in so many cases, it actually is better for the person without a disability. So I will just close on that. Thank you, Senator, for being part of our Zero Project Conference for Latin America and the Hispanic speaking world in this year to 2021. We thank you for all you have done for the protection of the rights of people with disabilities, and we wish you an excellent day. And to continue with our blog, we will introduce our next guest. Me corresponde presentar a Kate Nash, poseedora de una, or de una orden del imperio. It falls to me to introduce Kate Nash, an OBE holder who is a founder and CEO of Purple Space. Purple Space is the only world's um, networking and career development center for employees with disabilities. Kate is also an external advisor of the GSK World Disability Council, a strategic disability advisor to Post Office LTD, a disability advisor to Fujitsu, and a member of the UK government's business leaders group for disability confidence. We are honored to have her participation. So let's go with Kate Nash's uh, presentation. I'm delighted to join you in this conference today. I hope you're having a great day and that you can learn a lot and to enrich with all the different um, messages from the speakers. It's fantastic that you have this time, you took the time to learn more about this topic so we can all learn from the world community. And to think about the prospect um, employments for people with disability. And there are more of 300 million people in work age around the world that have some sort of disability. That's a huge amount of talent that we can get benefit uh, from. I'm Kate Natch and um, CE Purple Space's uh, CEO, which is the only network in the world that employment network that employs people with disability. We are in a community very large uh, with change agent agents. We have 1600 leaders in many organizations many global and based in different uh, countries in the world, including Latin America. What we want to do is to create confidence from within 
and to support organizations so they can establish and improve the effectivity and quality of the development groups so you can really move forward in the cultural change. Within five years, we've had a very important function to help those people and companies in a way to support also the organize so the organizations can learn more, do more and make better things. We also have to deal with community change agents are a really important part of the success of these organizations to be able to create inclusive policies and inclusive services and products. I want to talk about three things today. One has to deal with articulate the reasons of why it's so important to learn directly from employers and from the values of the groups. I want to give two examples of the practical changes that come from the creation of the employment uh, employers network employees network and i want to give you a little bit of the reason why the movement is so important it's an important instrument in accelerating the contribution among people with a lot of respect today we have the national day of disability every year in december and it's very important to learn directly from people with disabilities through what we do we know that one of the biggest challenges of employees is to have that people with disability can have they can bring their authentic them um, thank self to the workplace they can share information about the, their disabilities feel comfortable to ask for the changes or uh, adaptations that they need to perform their work correctly. We would like to work with our ally allies and want to keep on improving experiences. Sometimes there have been a little bit uh, defiant, uh, challenging, but we've encountered a way to manage it with a new identity. That means that we have a lot to share and sometimes organizations have data that are not adequate. Many companies, doesn't even have uh, data at all about the people that they hire with disabilities. And we know from good sources that the most of employers, employers will have 10 to 15% uh, of their workforce with people with disabilities. So many times it takes a lot of time to make sense of the different experiences. And we know that from our community, we listen over and over again that employees who we work with and employers, there are four that there are four things that they, they need to learn from people with disability through the groups from employers and the networks. The first thing is to learn about the real barriers that uh, includes external access, but also the trust channels that we can have. It's incredibly important to be able to have colleagues and compare clues and advices to our careers and to see how can we talk with other employers and how we can learn to sail in this world. How can we ask for the adjustment that are needed and how to trust in who we are and our performance. Sometimes the ERGs are a source, an important employment source to avoid making uh, assumptions and really to listen and learn directly from the people and from their experiences. In second place, we want to create employment groups that out can accelerate change. This is not something that is for diversity and inclusion of professionals among the organization. It's important that these groups are a group that we can work with, with the resources and also the employees that can help us to address frustrations and to enhance enthusiasms to support these leaders. And they have the responsibility from the point of view of building um, change leaders. And in third place, this has to do with creating communities and easy ways so our allies support us in our search of inclusion. And most importantly, to support us to really make 
things happen because we need to group and create different activities if we want to provide the right message. We are growing all over the world and now I don't see so many groups uh, of employees or ERGs within Latin America compared with the ones in all over the world. So we, we predict and hope to have a great, um, a big number of more vehicles of change to be able to see an introduction in places where we don't have this so developed. I would also would like to share some examples with you of the practical changes, the most exciting ones that we've seen in employment groups. First is related to the campaign of telling stories. And the second one is related with how to build trust among an organization and how this is going to increase the way in how people share information, personal information, which is, of course, related with the trust in building trust. First, we see that storytelling or telling stories is a vehicle, a mean to support this cultural change from different places in the world. One of the first parts where we witnessed this was in Shell. Shell created a campaign of uh, storytelling that said, be yourself. That was in 2014. They started with 15 people with different disabilities that were living in different places in the world because, because this is a multinational company. And then the campaign, what it, they wanted to do is that people shared information about how they could be themselves at the workplace and how they would have some changes were made and they were encouraging employees shell employees so the changes were implemented and then they weren't afraid to ask for them and made and it was a incredible success from the morning to the night the company had thousands of answers that thousand of answers about this day about this story that was told an individual story and it started to grow and grow and grow and it was a a campaign so interesting that employees and employers were so happy about it. Everyone in the business were really proud of this initiative. It was a campaign that resulted quite well. And now we see employees all over the world that use this tool as an instrument of change, as an instrument of cultural change. So we've seen other things related to this also, the Be Yourself campaign that they, created, they create their own story, their own storytelling, and they say, this is who I am. That's another, that's another campaign, but it's called, this is me. Uh, there are other companies that have created campaigns of storytelling of this type. So employees with disabilities can share their story and they are there and they feel proud on what they do, they talk about their skills and they talk about the, the gifts. And also, other, another one of my favorites is Unilever that says, I am me. This is like a very powerful campaign and very simple that in, encourages people at Unilever, whatever they are, to tell this story. This has been a great campaign, a great change movement in many places. And I think we can be certain and we can hope that employees and employers are going to notice different organizations, different businesses in different parts of the world. They can be certain that they don't need to be scared of sharing the story. They don't have to be scared of showing and telling who they are and they can feel good, feel brave ask for simple changes. Do not feel that this is going to be a favor. You have to feel that it's an answer that they deserve. The second example of a practical change in an employee group has to deal with improving the quality of thinking on how an organization builds trust among line managers and people with disabilities. 
for over the for many years we've been talking about our capacity and our leaders and that's why we created a new report of an open source nature that works to see how we are doing and what we are listening from our members as employees with disabilities choose to look for the cues that are easier for them to share information, personal information on their disability, uh, visual, auditive, or any other neural disabilities. We know that the language of dis disability can be a little bit hard and awkward. Perhaps it's really political on the legal definitions on dis uh, disabilities in all over the world. We know that there are difficulties with that, but there is a, tr a true and universal truth is really difficult for everyone to be themselves, our ourselves at work. So what they are doing, these resource groups are making easier for employees with disabilities, no matter what their disability is or how severe it is or the age when the onset um, happened is what they what they do is that it's easy to talk about this how to learn um to live with this how to learn to understand how we can talk and be proud of who we are so we're saying here on how employer employees can do these um adjustments and some of the cues that they are looking for have to deal with is having a senior, someone uh, who's got the position or is in charge of making a better digital access for people with disabilities. This is extraordinary. We've seen this happen in two years because of COVID-19. And this has, has meant that many have become more creative and we've shown different things. So employees are looking for this cues that are telling them we are trying to protect you we are trying to retain you to so you are with with us and they are looking for the cues and to make these adjustments to the work process and the cue, clues could be to notice where is this where the challenges are we're looking for some in a specific investment for people with disability in relationship with other colleagues to see who is in charge of supporting of supports with or without disability. This is really important to make it for us. I'm just starting to close my presentation. I'm really looking forward to listen to your questions. And what I wanted to do is that this chat uh, to be provocative, because I know you're listening to me and I know that you're going to have your own opportunity to promote change. To, to finish, of course, I want to remind you that many of you are going to be looking for and how to use, for instance, and how can you implement, you can implement one day of the disability house. We do it uh, on December the 3rd. This movement started a long time ago. Well, not that long ago in 2017, but we say now is the time all over the world to gather, to use the purple color and to show our contribution. And now that it's a worldwide um, phenomena, I, there are thousands of employees that are a part of this, this special day with the disability. They are part of the purple movement. And we are encouraging organizations to create their own videos with their senior executives and employees with disabilities. If you don't have them and would like to join, make a video and put it on the social networks. Someone with disability perhaps going to see and, and would like to support that business. I have a video, a short video that talks about the quality of what a great leadership is. It talks about success that has had, 
talks a little bit about hopes and ambitions of the future and together we can create a better world, a more positive world. Without a doubt, we're going to see on social networks and we're going to see things happening on December the 3rd. So I'm going to close and finish with your uh, thanking, your commitment, your interest, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and really anxious to listen to your questions. Thank you very much. What an interesting presentation, Kate. Thank you for sharing it at our conference. We would like to ask you a few questions. In this cultural change that you lead from purple space and thanks to the cases that you have shared with us, um, we can see how companies and employees can take a step beyond the implementation of internal policies of inclusion. We would like to know your opinion on the relationship between public policies and cult cultural change. It's a great question, and I hope you can hear me okay. You're giving me the thumbs up? Cool. So um, there, there is a huge role for legislation um, in countries around the world. So legislation and regulation has a significant role to play in building a level playing field for employees with disability um, and, and specifically anti-discrimination legislation plays a very strong role in driving the have-tos and the behaviours that we need to uh, deliver the workplace adjustments that employees with disability need. However, legislation always only ever gets us so far and cultural change in our minds really only happens when those who are most impacted um, by challenge and barriers in this case have a meaningful contribution um, to the process of change. So at Purple Space we talk about the three phases of change. So the first is when uh, countries and jurisdictions around the world will um, introduce anti-discrimination legislation. We call that the first phase. The second phase, which is an ongoing phase, is the process whereby employers start to make manifest that legislation. So they use the legislation to improve policy and practice and procedures and where employers get the enabling products that they need. And then the third phase of cultural change, um, which, is, which is starting to happen, is when employees with disabilities themselves choose to lean into their careers and choose to really supports their organizations to learn directly from their own experiences. So, so in, our, in our mind, there is absolutely a huge and vital role that legislation and public policy um, uh, delivers in building an inclusive world. Um, but the, you know, the way in which we can hasten that change is to make it easier for employees with disabilities to, to share their stories, share aspects of their lives, things that are working well, things that are not working well, uh, so that they can be part of the solution, so that they have skin in the game. So we call that the third phase of change. We definitely have uh, a lot of challenges to keep moving forward on inclusion. Your presentation focuses on resource groups and how this can be significant change for workers with disabilities. We could say that companies that embrace this group of collaborators are as available resources have gone on to empower people with disabilities and their leaders within the um, structure. Could you tell us about similar examples in public institutions? Absolutely. Um, we see often that employee resource groups can often start within the public sector. And if you look in different places around the world, um, in the very early stages of companies 
setting up resource groups, they often start within the public sector. So it's some examples of that. Um, so for example, in Australia, um, there is a government department, New South Wales Department for Communities and Justice. Uh, they one of the first government departments within Australia that uh, set up an employee resource group. And now after, I think, three years, they are one of the most successful employee resource groups within that particular department. So they have a, a very powerful role in helping the organisation to improve its policy and to remove the barriers uh, that employees with disabilities will face. Um, they have a senior business champion, so somebody within that government department who works with the ERG to understand where the problems are and start to better invest in the solutions that create more access. And then uh, lastly, that particular employee resource group has a place on the board. So there is a very strong line of sight in terms of the things that are challenging for employees and the business decisions that are made at the board within that public entity. So it's a very, very well known um, uh, employee resource group within Australia. And as a result of that, many other public uh, organisations have created their own employee resource groups. Um, and another example in Canada, for example, um, where we have the uh, Treasury Board uh, for Canada. We work closely, as I know you do, with Yasmin Laroche. Um, and that particular government department, for example, brought together all of the disability employee resource group leaders from different government departments and put on some training and support uh, to help those individuals to improve their leadership skills. So again, it was about cross networking across public sector. And then lastly, another example um, in the United Kingdom, uh, now most government departments will have an employee resource group. Uh, there is an umbrella body uh, called the Civil Service Disability Network, and they bring together network leaders across the public sector so they can share best practice, they can swap stories of the things that they're doing, the different activities. Um, and through a bursary scheme, which they launched some years ago, they started to identify new talent. So in terms of public sector, has a huge very powerful role in getting the wheels moving when it comes to employee resource groups. Por último, Kate, si alguien te Finally, Kate, if someone from our audience would like to create this uh, group, this uh, employment group in their companies, organizations, or institutions, what would be your recommendations to start these first steps, to take these first steps? Great question. Thank you so much for your questions. I appreciate uh, the engagement. So uh, one thing that you could do, and it's fantastic that you may be thinking about setting up an employee resource group. We work with many hundreds of organizations and they never regret ever uh, setting up an employee resource group. They are a wonderful instrument of change and positivity and peer group support. So some very early simple steps that could be um, created. One would be maybe to host a virtual webinar where you might talk about some of the challenges um, that employees with disability might have. You might um, start to talk about some of the data and the statistics about uh, people with disabilities uh, working uh, within that company or more generally uh, within the country in which you live. Um, and it may be that you want to identify a small number of people with disabilities who are prepared to talk a little bit about their story. Um, and maybe some of the good things that they have experienced, maybe some good things that a line manager has done or a business leader or some of the positive experiences that they have had as the organisation makes an adjustment for them. So my advice is to always keep it simple. 
Um, there's no right or wrong way in setting up an employee resource group. Uh, the reality is it's about generating some excitement and some passion and to identify maybe a small number of volunteers who want to get things moving. So certainly set up maybe a little virtual webinar, uh, bring some people along to talk about their experiences, uh, make sure that you make it open and inclusive so you're identifying maybe some uh, allies and line managers who would too like to lend uh, their passion and their commitment and desire to build a better working world and share stories, make it easier for people to be who they are. And then start to think about a strategy, have a small group of volunteers, um, make sure that you connect with other departments within the organisation like the diversity and inclusion team. Um, but certainly we've got lots of resources on our website, many of them are free and open resources, so do make sure you take a look. Um, and if we can support any organisation who may be thinking about setting up an employee resource group, then just let us know and we'll give you a little starter pack um, of information. But yeah, my, my, my main message as I close is you would never regret it. We, the, these, these are real powerhouses for change and um, yeah, doing an incredible job to build culture change and support people to feel good about who they are and what they deliver for their organisations. Thank you, Kate, for once again for being part of our 2021 Zero Project Conference for Latin America and the Spanish-speaking world. Um, we wish you every success, all the success, and have an excellent day. We will invite you to continue attending the sessions scheduled for today on both channels. We again channel uh, schedule for our, our platforms. There is no doubt that we still have interesting um, panels on both channels. We invite you to participate in Challenge 1 in the sessions inclusive business, cultural, and then opening pathways, internships, and inter in, in Channel 2 public programs, training and employment, and after public programs model of labor inclusion. So once again, we thank you for your participation on the 2021 Zero Project Conference for Latin America and the Spanish-speaking World Employment and ICTs. Good afternoon.